Good morning. If I may begin with the story, there was once a person who held a dinner party, and this person was notorious for feeding a dog from the table food. And during the party, the dog started to come up and scratch the owner with its paw, trying to get more food. And the owner told the dog, no, no, down, down. And someone at the party looked at them and they said, you know, the dog's an irrational animal. It doesn't understand that. You need to train the dog. And the owner quickly retorted, that dog's not irrational. One of three things happened at that moment. One, either that dog became fully conscious and aware and rational, as well as the owner. Or number two, at that moment, all dogs were declared fully aware, rational, as aware and cognitive as us. Or three, which is probably likely three, is that the owner of the dog responded to what they presumed the statement was, but they never truly heard the statement, and therefore their response was, well, not overly smart. Sadly, I think we could all attest that it would probably be number three. And in saying that, we have a tendency to hear, but not listen. We presume what people say without fully investing ourselves into what they truly have said and thinking about it before we respond. That is why I find it interesting when people say, well, those Jewish people, like the ones today in the first reading in Antioch, those people, they didn't accept Jesus. All you have to do is accept him and follow and do what he says. And often I find them with the proverbial finger pointing at those, those individuals. But as the old saying goes, one finger pointed at the other person means I've got three pointing back at me. Because if we stop and think about it, the Jewish people of Antioch are no different from anybody that we might run into today. Humanity doesn't change. Technologically, we're much more advanced than they were, but we don't change. Human nature does. I'm sure in Antioch, standing there, opposed to Paul and Barnabas, were the synagogue officials. They're the people that we see in society that need power. They need authority. They have to be the one who dictates to us. They have to tell us what we're supposed to do because doing that feeds their own ego, their own desire. And if the synagogue officials would have said, you know, Paul, Barnabas, what you're saying makes a whole lot of sense. We need to really think about this. There is the fear right there that they might somehow lose that power, lose that authority. And as you know, that's a bridge far too far to cross. They're not going to go that way. There are no outlets for them if they were to relinquish power to be influential. So they're not, they have to stand in opposition to Paul and Barnabas. More so out of their own insecurity and their own need for power than a theological disagreement. Then I'm sure that day you had certain pseudo-intellectuals who would have stood in opposition of Paul and Barnabas and we read 
we encounter these individuals every day who focus on the letters that come behind people's names rather than the individuals themselves. True story, I knew a professor in the seminary, so intelligent, the guy had multiple doctorates, so intelligent, but to drive a car was beyond his capacity. So he rode a bicycle. You and I can drive a car, right? Yeah, we probably don't have multiple doctorates. Can't speak seven or eight languages. We can drive a car. So we shouldn't look at individuals and say, oh my God, look at that person. What they do for a living. They're a doctor, they're a lawyer. Oh, they must be very intelligent. We have to listen to them. Sure, they may be very intelligent in their field, but living here in Alabama, if your AC goes out and call him Dr. Laura, you're calling the HVAC man. Go figure, right? Toilet blacks up. Who you call? Okay? So we have to reconsider the way we view intellectuals. My gosh. Late night television glorifies these pseudo intellectuals who will come out there and express themselves on our medical wellness, our foreign policies. And all they are are actors, actresses, or sports athletes. Pseudo intellectuals. And they would have been there looking at Paul and Barnabas saying to themselves, oh, who are these people? They're not like us. Look at us. We are successful. We have done these things. Listen to us, not to them. Then you would have had a group of people, probably the majority that day, who are listening to a certain degree. Like so many of us, even today, when we attend church, we listen to a certain degree. Have you, and don't raise your hand, please. I'll raise my hand for all of you. Haven't we all at some time during Sunday church service found ourselves daydreaming about what we have to do later today or what our next week is like? Please don't and so hurt me by you. No, you've never done that. Uh, I do. It's not uncommon to see that there would have been people there who, just like us today, would have been there listening but not really hearing Paul and Barnabas because their mind is thinking, because they have the same needs as we do. I've got to feed my family, I've got to have a job, I've got to provide a roof over my head. All of these things they are having to deal with that we have to deal with. It's not that they have any ill will toward Paul and Barnabas as anybody here today has ill will toward me. It's just we've got all kinds of fish in the ocean and our brain only is able to filter out so much. So we cannot I find, look at Paul and Barnabas and their interaction with the Jews of Antioch and go, oh, you miserable Jews. Because again, one toward them means three toward me. But on this, the Good Shepherd Sunday, how can we truly distinguish ourselves from that people at that time in Antioch? How can we be different? How can we hear the voice of the shepherd? And boy, that is a very difficult question. I find it very difficult in our age, especially when we hear shepherds, our bishops of the church, the direct descendants of the apostles. And you can hear certain bishops saying one thing and certain bishops saying the exact opposite.
Germany, they say one thing. Bishops in other parts of the world say something completely opposite. We hear this not only on issues of morality, we hear this on other issues, liturgy, theology, and one wonders which one is the voice of the Holy Spirit? Which one is the voice of God? When Bishop A is telling me X and Bishop B is telling me Y, which one do I attribute the voice of God to? Might I propose something different? To hear the voice of God, and it is a language. To become familiar with the language, we have to realize that to understand the language, we have to hear the language. It's not a monologue, it's a dialogue. So I have to hear the language of God rather than speaking my own language. And then once I hear the language, I understand the language of God, then I can communicate in that language to Him. That language is His prayer. The easiest way I can always tell you to start is by taking five minutes, and I've said this so often, I'll continue. Take five minutes in your day. I know your day is busy. I know you have many obligations that you have to do. I know this for I too am in the same boat. But take five minutes of your day. Go sit by yourself. Take your crucifix, not cross, the cross is too sterile and clean. Take your crucifix. Place your crucifix somewhere where you can see it. If you don't have a wall crucifix or something you can hold, take your rosary crucifix. Look at it. One of the first things you'll realize and one of the most profound things you'll realize is, number one, I did that. And I speak for myself, not for you. But you can look at that crucifix over there and say, my priest caused that. Jesus died and suffered. Why? Because my priest sinned. I have sinned. My sins did that to him. The moment we start to realize that, not only mine and yours, but everybody's, that we're all in the same boat. We caused that. He died like that for all of us. Then that helps us to become humble. To realize that everybody around us is struggling as well. So how can I condemn someone else when I myself are equally at blame? May not be for that sin, but it's for others. That's the first stage of wisdom is humility. And when we start to gain wisdom, then we start to gain holiness of life. Because we realize these are behaviors that we don't want to live ourselves and we don't want to pass down to younger generations. So to hear the voice of God means we have to stop and listen for five minutes every day. So I encourage you. I know your day will be busy, especially today as you go off to celebrate Mother's Day and Happy Mother's Day for all of you. But take five minutes. Be still. Be quiet. Let God speak to you, to your heart, and then see where it takes you. May Almighty God be with you. May He bless you. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.